amen, amen. Amen. Well, welcome to Wednesday Night Bible Study. Thank you. We uh, are grateful to have everybody on the internet. Um, we appreciate you tuning in. You caught us having a little bit of fun. We were laughing, but you know, around here we've always said, if something's dead, you ought to bury it. Amen. Amen. <laughs> And so we try not to be dead around here. We try to, you should be able to enjoy church. Amen. Amen. I have a good time when I'm here. I thought you were talking about we are laughing over some remote or something. <laughs> no, this guy is crazy. He's crazy. Okay, it's time to get serious because we're going to look at the Bible. Um, turn your Bibles to John chapter 4. <laughs> We've been doing an expository study on John chapter 4, and the way I see it, even if the Lord tarries for 10 more years, we'll still be studying John by the time he, <laughs> by the time we get raptured, amen? Because we're taking our time. We're not in any uh, race. If we we're in a race, we've already conceded, we've lost. Um, you know what we're doing after John? <laughs> <laughs> Um, no, I have no clue what we're doing after John because I just said it's going to last 10 years. <laughs> so John chapter 4, look at verse uh, 28. 28. We're trying to finish up this conversation and this interaction with the woman at the well. And in verse 28 it says, The woman then left her water pot and went her way into the city and saith to the man, Come see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came unto him. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we do thank you for the evening. We do thank you for our salvation, God. We I can't even imagine, Lord, what it'd be like going through the times that we're in right now with no hope, without you, without the knowledge that you're going to take care of us regardless of what happens may not be the way that we want to be taken care of, but we will be taken care of. Uh, you will supply our every need. God, what a comfort to know that we're not going to have to go through the great tribulation, that we'll be raptured out before the tribulation takes place. But Lord, we do recognize we might have to have some persecution before the tribulation starts, but we also know that you'll make our hearts ready for that. God, I pray for everybody that hears this message that their heart would be soft, their ears would be open, and their eyes would not have any scales on them that would be able to see clearly, Lord, and that their Christian walk and their devotion to you would be strengthened and grown closer and closer, Lord. Uh, we praise you that we've increased the services here. Uh, your word says that we should not forsake the assembling of ourselves together and we should do it even more as we see the day approaching and Lord we've taken that to heart we've increased our services we pray for your blessing on it we love you Lord we just praise you for all that you do for us it's in Jesus name amen man could you imagine the things that are going on in the world today could you imagine facing that as a lost person no I bet you there's folks that lay awake all night, every night, just worried about everything that's going on in the world. You know, I, I've often said that you'll have greater peace if you uh, quit watching the news. Yep. Um, I quit watching the news for quite a long period of time and I had a lot more peace, but I've happened to tune into some news outlets because I have to know what's going on in the world in order to preach about stuff, amen? But y'all don't have to turn into the news, you know, unless you're preaching. Um, certainly if somebody comes to you at the water fountain at work and, and starts a conversation, it wouldn't take you long to get caught up on everything. Just think the worst it could possibly be, and it's probably worse than that. <laughs> Amen. Amen. So last week we are talking about how Jesus oftentimes referred to our Christian walk in terms of farming. Now, this is a bunny trail that we've been going down for a while. It really doesn't have a whole lot to do with the woman at the well, but there was something that she said that sprung us off onto this bunny trail. And it's a very worthwhile bunny trail. So we're going to finish the thoughts of it, and then we're going to move on with it. But 
here's some of the things that we've gleaned to this point, and you'll say, yeah, that is some pretty good stuff. There's three aspects of harvesting a farm, just like there are three aspects to harvesting souls. There's the first fruits, there's the main harvest, and then there's the gleanings, amen? Mm -hmm. And so we learned that just like farming, the more seeds you sow, the more fruit you're going to get. You want to be a soul winner? Um, Satan's going to see to it, at least, I, I mean, there's exceptions to every rule, but Satan's going to see to it that nobody's going to come knocking on your door and say, do you know how I can get to heaven? <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know, they're not going to come seeking you out. You got to be throwing out seed. You got to be planting seed, amen? Mm -hmm. And the more you throw out there, the more fruit you're going to get. If you drop off one track a year and takes you 10 years to lead somebody to Christ, it's not because there's something wrong with the times we're living in. There's something wrong with the amount of seed you're putting out. Amen. And so uh, we also learned that the seed that you're supposed to sow, it's supposed to be good seeds. Amen. Amen. So uh, there's a parable about the sower who sows seeds and the tares came up in the weed. Amen. And uh, it, we're not supposed, and his servants came to him and said, Master, didn't you sow good seed? Well, he sowed good seed. Yes. But an enemy came and threw tear seeds in with his good seed. And so how all this fits with the stuff we're studying. We have the good seed of the word of God, which is the King James Bible. And yet the enemies come and he's put in tares. He's put in seeds that aren't. Yes. The pure words of God. Amen. Amen. And which brings us to the fourth thing that we've looked at so far. The good seed was the word of God or is the word of God. We said that everybody is supposed to sow the good seed. Everybody. There's no exceptions to that. A lot of folks think that's the preacher's job. It's the preacher's job to win souls. And it is. You know who else's job it is? Your job your job amen amen um you know the power of a growing church as a church grows it actually picks up momentum because the more people that are out sowing seed the more people that are gonna the bible says that if you sow bountifully you will reap bountifully it didn't say if you sow bountifully you'll reap bountifully unless you're in the end times said if you sow bountifully you'll reap bountifully amen? amen we also learn that you're supposed to stay focused on the sowing and not on the opposition or the circumstance that's around you mm -hmm. you know you don't look up and say oh there's rain clouds i better not sow today and then it doesn't rain and you wasted a day mm -hmm. amen mm -hmm. you don't look at somebody uh and say well that's not fertile ground because you don't know what god's been doing in their heart that ground could be really fertile. I saw um, on uh, uh, Facebook, I subscribed to some King James, some different King James websites, and there was a cartoon on it, and there was three people sitting on a bench. There was two folks in a suit, and then a motorcycle guy with a vest and uh, cut off sleeves, and, and uh, another guy in a suit sitting next to him, and the two folks on either side of him were thinking, Boy, this ain't much of a Christian. And this biker had his head bowed. He was reading his Bible and he was praying, Lord, thank you for saving a sinner like me. <laughs> you know. Amen. So who was right there? Amen. 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 So it doesn't matter what the circumstances are. It doesn't matter what you think the conditions are. You have no clue what's going on in that person's life. Amen. And I have heard story after story after story after story where a preacher went into a circumstance that they had no intention of being in. It was just the Holy Ghost put them in that place at that time. And um, somebody, there's cases where people were, just as a preacher comes into their life, they were praying, Lord, they weren't Christians, but they, their life was a mess. Lord, you need to send a preacher because my life's a mess and I need help. And a preacher shows up on the door that wasn't even planning on going there. Amen. Amen. And so uh, <clears throat> that's another confirmation that that 
guy in a remote or gal in a remote tribe someplace where the name of Jesus has never been heard, if they reach out to him, he'll send a missionary. He'll send that there's nobody that's going to have an excuse. Even in the most remote, remote tribe that you've ever heard of, there's not a single person in that tribe that's going to be able to stand before God with an excuse of, I never knew, nobody ever told me. <laughs> because the Bible's clear that um, everybody's going to be without excuse when they stand at the judgment. Right. Everybody's given enough light that they can know to reach out to God. Amen? Amen. And so... That's what we've studied so far. Let's continue with our study. And we're still talking about uh, farming. You're supposed to sow whether you're young, middle-aged, or old. That covers this whole crowd, amen? There's the young. You guys ain't quite middle-aged yet. I guess you're still part of young. I guess we don't have the middle-aged represented. We are middle-aged. All right. Is anybody over 35? Middle-aged. All right. 35 is middle age. Yeah. I remember when I turned 35. 35 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> that uh, I made a comment about being middle age. And somebody said, you're kidding me. You're not middle age. I said, what's middle age? I said, 60. I said, you know a lot of 120 year olds, do you? <laughs> Look at Ecclesiastes chapter 11. We're Bible believers here, and you know what that means? It means we look at the Bible. And some people don't like the turning in the Bible and looking, but it's not going to change. Ecclesiastes 11, look at verse 6. This tells you it doesn't matter how old you are. In the morning sow thy seed. When you're young, sow thy seed. In the evening withhold not thine hand, for thou knowest not whether thou shalt prosper, either this or that, or whether they both shall be alike good. See, it doesn't matter how old you are. You sow that seed. And when you're old, you don't, uh, uh, in the evening, you don't withhold your hand. You still sow that seed, amen? Amen. And uh, it's good for you. It's good for you. If you want fruit in your harvest, you need to weep over souls. You need to weep over souls. And there's a sad thing in Christianity. I think it's a really sad thing. There comes a point in your Christian walk where usually when you're a fairly young Christian, it's pretty easy to weep over souls. When you become a more experienced Christian, you become a little more callous, a little bit more hard-hearted, and you don't weep so much over souls. But then you become an old Christian. You're in the twilight of your years. And you weep over everything spiritual. <laughs> you weep over souls. You weep over the condition of the country you live Amen. in. You weep over the condition of the church. You weep over the condition of the pulpits and the preachers. Because everything's fading away. And you can see that... It's not good anymore. It's not good anymore. In my Bible study, I'm in uh, Jeremiah. Jeremiah talks a lot about the preacher. And uh, if you're a preacher, that should just rip your heart out. Mm -hmm. The preachers. And uh, one of the um, books that I read when I was struggling with my call to preach was a book entitled, Dear Preacher, Please Quit. And the book pretty much focused on the pulpits are filled with preachers that aren't called to preach. And uh, you should be sure of your calling. Look at Psalm 126. Psalm 126, look at verse 5. They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. You know, if you're a, a, one of those Christians that's a little bit more, and I'm telling you from experience, <laughs> I'm pointing a finger at you, but there's three pointing back at me. If you're one of those preachers that, or one of those Christians who have 
gone a little ways in your Christian walk and your heart's a little bit harder and you don't really weep over souls anymore, I can tell you from experience, you get better success in soul winning when you weep over souls than you do when you don't. Look at verse 6. You want 26, verse 6. He that goeth forth weep and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. It's that verse in the Bible that gave us the hymn, bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves, we shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves. Amen. Amen. But you know what the hymn doesn't touch? The condition of bringing those sheaves in. <laughs> You're supposed to go forth weeping, weeping. Jeremiah was the weeping prophet. That's what they call him, the weeping prophet. Amen. So if you want to have a good harvest, you need to, basically what, you, what it's saying is you need, to, you need to care. You need to care. You need to have a heart that's tender for it. Look at Luke chapter 19. Luke be having some long chapters in it, doesn't it? Look at verse 41. Jesus. And when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it. We're supposed to be Christ-like, right? Mm -hmm. Have you ever sat over looking your city and wept? You know, it says over there in... Uh, um, Jonah, they, their right hand doesn't know what their left hand does. That's the condition of those folks. They don't know. They don't know nothing. Amen. They don't. They they don't know. They think they know everything, but they don't know anything. Amen. Mm -hmm. Look at Philippians three. I'm trying to make a point here because it's something that's missing in the Christian world right now. We don't seem to weep over the souls of men. We don't seem to have a heart that's soft towards the souls of men. I hate it when we get like five pages that are stuck together. Look at verse 18. For many walk of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. When's the last time that you witnessed to somebody and they rejected Christ and you went away weeping? You know, I, I'm reading a story about Meet the Holy Spirit written by Dr. Jack Hiles. And, and he tells a story about he was led to the Lord to go visit somebody and he knocked on the door and the guy answered the door. First, he argued with the Holy Spirit ghost because he told the Holy Ghost this guy's at work this guy, I know he works during the day and I know that this is part of his shift he's not even home and the Lord said go to his house go now and he argued and they, as he's arguing he's climbing in the car okay Lord I'm going but it's a waste of time it's a waste of gas it's a waste of energy it gets to the guy's house and he knocks on the door and the guy answers the door and Dr. Heil said, well, it's kind of surprised. I kind of thought you'd be at work. Now, somebody came to your house, knocked on your door, and you answered, and they said, I thought you'd be at work. Wouldn't you say, why are you here then? <laughs> that didn't take place. But uh, he started talking to the guy about his soul, and the guy said, when he said, I thought you'd be at work, the guy said, I forgot something. I had to come home and get it, and I just had lunch while I was home. I need to get back to work right now. And he said, well, can we just have a minute to talk about your soul? And he said, no, we can't have a minute to talk about my soul. I'm in a hurry. I need to get back to work, et cetera, et cetera. Dr. Hiles turned around and said goodbye and climbed in his car. And the Holy Ghost just grabbed hold of his heart. And he sat in his car and wept. And he went back up to the guy's house and he knocked on the door again. The guy answered the door with an angry look on his face that he, you're pestering me now. And Dr. Hiles fell at his feet and hugged his feet, bawling. 
And the guy said, what, what's gotten into you? What's the matter? He goes, you need to get saved and you need to get saved today. And the guy looked down at him and he said, you really care. And he said, of course I care. There's not a soul in the world that I'd rather see saved right now other than you. And the guy accepted Christ as a savior. They don't care what you know until they know that you care. And we live in a society that says, hide all your emotions, man up, don't shed a tear. But there's folks that are dying. Amen. There's folks that are going to hell. And we sit quiet. And we don't do what we should be doing. And we don't cry over them. And we don't weep over them. And God looks at us and he says, you cold-hearted Christian. You, you're, you're lukewarm and you're cold-hearted and you don't care. You're willing that they go to hell. We shouldn't be willing that they go to hell. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Preacher, this isn't fun. We started off having fun. It's good for us. Mm -hmm. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. It's not going to work on in 2 Corinthians. thought I turned right to it, but I didn't. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and look at verse 3. Paul's talking to the church at Corinth and he says, and I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. You know why we don't want to cry? Because we think it's a sign of weakness. You know what God says about our weakness? In your weakness, I can use my strength. Amen. I can manifest myself and my power through your weakness. I'm not smart enough to lead a soul to Christ, but I've led, I don't even know how many people I've led to Christ, and I'm not smart enough to do it. I wish I'd lead more. I wish God would break every one of our hearts. The problem is, see, it's not just that we don't cry for the stranger that we don't know. We don't cry for our loved ones. <laughs> Oh, we'll say, you know, pray for so-and-so, they're lost. When have you got on your knees and broke down before God? Say, God, this is my relative, whatever they may be. I remember I had a bullheaded brother, and I shed so many tears over that guy's soul, and now he's a preacher. And I'm not taking any credit for it. I didn't lead him to Christ. But I sure cried over his soul. And now he's a preacher. Now, we don't line up with his church at all. But I, I believe he's saved. Mm -hmm. And I believe that he leads people to the Lord. I believe he cares about his flock. Amen. His church is way bigger than ours. I think he's running 47 people now in a little team. He's in a little town like we are. About 47 people. You know, if you're going to farm, if you're going to farm for souls, because that's the context, right? But we're going to talk about some things that farmers have to do in order to get a crop. Amen? Amen. If you're going to farm, you need to spend time plowing. You need to spend time tilling and hoeing. You see, it's more important to get the soil right than it is just to throw a seed in there. So you gotta have some patience. You gotta work with folks. You gotta bring them along. You have to get that ground ready. You need to pick up the rocks that are in the way of the seed and, and you need to blast out some stumps of some trees that have fallen over and the stumps still laying there in the ground. You need to blast those out and you need to add nutrients, you know, in, in farming times, I guess, I, I believe in organics that talk about putting fertilizer on it, but I'd say put compost on it or manure or something on it. I wouldn't say put chemical fertilizers on it, but you got to get that ground ready. Sometimes you'll have to get fruit from areas where you didn't sow. 
uh, Lisa and I have been doing a lot of studying on, on the local vegetation and and uh, we got a few places on this property that have edible plants that we didn't sow, but we're going to encourage them to grow. Amen. Amen. And sometimes you're going to sow a lot and you're not going to get any fruit. To see, just like you have no control over that seed, whether it sprouts and becomes a plant, you have no control over that soul and whether that seed's going to grow and they're going to accept Christ. But God's given us some insight on things that he pays attention to. If you care, if you cry, if you're watering that seed with your tears, God likes that. And God says, I'm going to pay attention to that. I'm going to strengthen their witness. I'm going to make the people around them take notice of them. You better live right too, because people will take notice of you. But here's a wonderful thing. If you're so, if you're sowing in tears and you fall down in front of the folks you're trying to witness to and do something wrong, oftentimes God just kind of puts a shield there and they don't even see it. <laughs> Amen. That's not an excuse to live carelessly, but you're in first Corinthians chapter two, just, Look over at chapter chapter three. Just a page over, amen. Mm -hmm. Look at verse uh, seven. So neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. You know, we talk about you can't lose your salvation, but you can lose rewards. There's people that do no, no labor. You know, there's people that say, I'm the song director in my church. I don't need to sow seed. <laughs> no, you need to sow seed. Uh, I'm a Sunday school teacher. That takes care of my seed sowing. No, you, you need to sow seed where you're at. It's easier when you know people. Yeah. And to have friends, one must show himself friendly, amen? Mm -hmm. amen. So you'll get, you'll also get some, uh, your reaping comes at the judgment seat of Christ, the rewards that you get. Look at Galatians chapter six. Galatians chapter six. Some folks say, man, I, I've witnessed a lot and I've never seen anything and I don't get any rewards. And well, your reward comes at the judgment seat of Christ. Look at Galatians 6, look at verse 8. It says, for he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the spirit shall of the spirit reap life everlasting. And so when you're sowing that seed, it's spiritual seed. You're sowing to your spirit and you're sowing to the spirit of those that you're planting the seed in. Amen. Amen. So the, the reaping of your rewards for the most part comes at the judgment seat of Christ, but you're also going to get some reaping down here as well. Go back to John chapter four. Look at verse 36. And he that reapeth receiveth wages and gathereth fruit unto life eternal, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. And see, folks take verses like that and they say, see, if you're not winning souls, you're not saved. And that's not what that verse says. <laughs> what that verse is talking about is gather fruit unto life eternal. The person that you sowed the seed in that turned to Christ now has eternal life just like Amen. you already had eternal life. Amen? Amen. And, uh, you know, there's an old hymn, and as a matter of fact, there's an old movie about will there be any stars in your crown, and it's talking about souls. Is there anybody that you led to Christ when you get to heaven? Uh, Dr. Ruckman used to say, are you going to have any fish on your stringer? Because he is a fisherman, right? And I, was, I used to be a fisherman. I can't claim being a fisherman because I'm just too busy and I don't seem to ever find time to get to a lake and fish. But man, I got some pictures of me with some good sized fish. I can say that I 
have been a fisherman. And you know what? If you don't throw that hook out there, you're not going to catch anything. Mm -hmm. I've never once in all the time that I fish, and I fished for years back when I was in the military, um, if I wasn't on base working, I was fishing or sweeping. Uh, I fished all the time. Now, I have caught a fish with my bare hand sneaking up on it in a creek. I never thought I could do it. And as I'm getting close down there to grab that thing, I'm thinking it must be dead. But as soon as I got my fingers around it, it started wiggling. It, I don't know if it was asleep or what, but I've never in all my time fishing had a fish swim up to the bank and said, here I am, just take me. Got to put some effort into it, amen? Yep. The Bible calls this laying hold on eternal life. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 6. I know we're looking at a lot of Bible tonight, but you know what? This subject is probably the second most important subject in your Christian walk. The first one is what got you saved. Now you're supposed to I like the old preacher used to say, a church is just one beggar that goes out and shows another beggar where their bread is. Amen. Amen. So 1 Timothy chapter 6, look at verse 19. Laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. Man, that's some good stuff. All this is good stuff. But there's even more. There's even more. There's going to be creatures such as bugs and animals that are in your garden, in your planting, that uh, mess up your garden. There's going to be rodents, bugs. I, I cut my teeth at preaching at a rescue mission. And uh, the one of the first rescue missions that I've ever preached in was Boise Rescue Mission. And and um, the way Boise Rescue Mission was set up, it was like a three-fourth wall that went up there and there was about a two-foot space between the kitchen and the... And so when they started serving food, the smell of that food came up over the top of that wall and you may as well just shut down because those folks aren't thinking about spiritual food. They're, these folks are hungry, they're homeless. And so what I would do when I went there and preached, as soon as I got the whiff of the food, I would wrap up wherever I was and tell the folks, hey, I'm just going to stick around. We talked about your soul. I'm just going to stick around. And when you're done having your meal, I'll still be here. If you want to come and, and talk about your soul, I'll be here. Well, this one particular night, this guy came up. And I'm going to tell you the truth. There's... Two types of people, well, there's three types of people at a rescue mission. There's drug addicts who have destroyed their lives or alcoholism, whatever. There's lazy people that think that you're a chump because you actually work when you can go freeload. And all. There's those types of people there. And then there's people that are legitimately down on their luck yeah. and having a hard time. Those folks still exist. Well, this guy came to me and he wanted to talk about his soul this old guy came up with white hair. He was a critter. He was a bug. He was a snake. He was a rat. Amen? And he starts contradicting everything I'm telling this guy. But I'm showing the guy Bible. And finally, this old man, I, I think he was a demon. <laughs> and I know that people think you're crazy when you say that. But he turned and looked at me, and the look in his eyes, they were just steel-cold eyes. He says, you may, not be, you, you may not know, but I might be the devil's advocate. I said, oh, no, I know. You are the devil's advocate. Amen? Amen. So you got these critters that you're going to have to, to deal with. Look at Songs of Solomon, chapter 2. It's Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Songs of Solomon. Look at chapter 2 and verse 15. It says, 
Take us the foxes, the little foxes that spoil the vines, for our vines have tender grapes. You're gonna have critters that you're gonna to have to deal with. You know, here in our little private little farm we got here, we don't have them all year long. Just when the berries start showing up on the bushes, we got chipmunks that show up, and boy, they like to take every... Have we even harvested a berry off of our berry bushes? When we first planted them. When we first planted them. <laughs> And chipmunks come and take everything. So you're going to have critters that you have to deal with. And you're also completely dependent upon the weather. Completely. What are you saying, preacher? I'm saying that to have a harvest is work. Yes. You have to deal with all kinds of stuff. Amen? Amen. So weather is something that you're, you're completely... Look at Amos. So you're... Uh, go to Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, and Amos. It's right after Joel. And I gave you a bunch of books because they're all short books. It'll help you find it. Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, and Amos. Look at Amos chapter 4. And um, look at verse 6. And I also have given you plainness of teeth in all your cities and want of bread in all your places yet have ye not returned unto me saith the Lord and also I have withhold the rain from you when there were wet when there were yet three months to the harvest and I caused it to rain upon one city and caused it not to rain upon another city one piece was rained upon, and the other piece, whereupon it rained not, withered. So two or three cities wandered unto one city to drink water, but they were not satisfied. Yet have they not returned unto me, saith the Lord. So you're dependent upon, we can go down through verse 11, but I think the point's already made. You're dependent completely upon the weather. And the Lord says he can make it rain on one place and make it not rain on another place. And certainly where we live, we see that all the time. And yeah. Alamosa, we're in this little donut hole. And sometimes it snows all around us. We get snow to the south, west, east, and north. And we don't get any. And we need snow around here. This is a dry, high desert area. You need the moisture, amen? amen. And so how can you have an impact on the rain? Well, pay attention to the message if you sow weeping. <laughs> if it, it's all, you know what, it's on, it's on your heart. It's always about the heart. It's about the heart of the guy you're witnessing to or the gal that you're witnessing to, witnessing to or the child that you're witnessing to. And it's about your heart too. And your heart can have an impact on their heart. Mm -hmm. Because if they see that you really care, It touches somebody when somebody, especially in the time that we live in, if you pick up on somebody that legitimately cares about you, it touches your heart. Your heart might make your heart soft where it was hard. It's good stuff, isn't it? Amen. Amen. As our text in John 4.35 says, we have to lift up our eyes. We have to lift up our eyes. Maybe this gives some added meaning to Proverbs 29, 18, where it says, where there is no vision, the people perish. If you don't have a vision for souls, everybody around you is going to perish. You got to have a vision. Where there's no vision, the people perish. So you have false preachers and pulpits all across the country that are trying to get this ecumenical garbage going and let's have a love fest with the Catholic Church. Today I watched a female preacher that said, if we just put aside doctrine, we'll, lead, we'll uh, convert 10 times the souls that we're doing by all this arguing on doctrine. And you want to know the truth of the matter is, if you throw out doctrine, you're not going to lead one soul to Christ. You may have a really nice 
social club and you may have really high numbers in your church but none of them are saved and a preacher is called to feed the sheep not herd the goats amen amen so where there's no vision the people perish let's go back to john chapter 4 john chapter 4 i can tell you what i i truly enjoy putting this message together this week i needed it i needed it here according to verses 37 and 38 you are working the field with other workers look at that verse 37 and 38 and hearing is satan one soweth and another reapeth i sent you to reap that whereupon ye bestowed no labor other man labored and ye are entered into their labors isn't that something mm -hmm. so you're you're going to sow seeds that other folks are going to reap. Some other folks are going to sow seeds that you reap. And the Bible, we've already gone over it. It's either the person that sows or the people that waters. God provides the increase, right? Yes. When you consider some of the parables that Jesus gave you, you're going to figure out that you get paid for your work. You're not going to get money from somebody else's work. And I'm just using money as an example. I'm, I don't think he's going to pay us with money. I don't think you're going to get to heaven. He's going to say, here's 10 bucks. Go buy a candy bar. You know, I don't think it works that way. You get paid for what you do. And if you want an example of that, we're not going to go read it, but go read Matthew 20. Just read the whole chapter. You get paid for what you do. You will not get paid for what somebody else did. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Second Corinthians chapter 10. Look at verse 12. For we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that can mend themselves, but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. But we will not boast of things without our measure, but according to the measure of the rule which God hath distributed to us, a measure to reach even unto you. For we stretch not ourselves beyond our measure as though we reached not unto you. For we are come as far as to you also in preaching the gospel of Christ, not boasting of things without our measure, that is, of other man's labors, but having hope when your faith is increased that we shall be enlarged by your according to our rule abundantly to preach the gospel in regions beyond you and not to boast in another man's line of things made ready to our hand. See, Paul's saying we're doing our business. <laughs> I mean, that's a lot of words, but he's basically saying we're doing our business. We're not trying to claim your business. We're doing our business. Mm -hmm. Amen? Amen. And you need to do your business. So you enter into their labors and they enter into your labors. If they're laboring, we got a lot of Christians that don't labor anymore. Yeah. The Bible says, pray to the Lord of the harvest that he'll send laborers into the harvest. And we need laborers. Hence, the Bible refers to fellow laborers. Look at Luke, we got quite a few verses here. I might not go over all of them. I might just look at some and have you, but look at Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10 and look at verse two. Therefore said he unto them, the harvest is truly great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. Um, I'm just going to give you some other references because I want to cover more ground tonight. But if, if you're interested, Matthew chapter 9, verse 27 and 28. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9. If I'm going too fast, just say slow Amen. down. 1 
Philippians 4, 3. And let's look at 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 3. And verse 2. Here's an example of Paul practicing what he preached. And sent Timo Timotheus, our brother and minister of God and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ to establish you and to comfort you concerning your faith. So a lot of those verses are where Paul's sending somebody. Mm -hmm. Laborers, fellow laborers. Paul makes reference to fellow laborers, amen? amen? So in farming, sometimes you have to thin out the plants. I don't know if any of you have ever planted carrots before, mm -hmm. but carrot seeds are really little and you plant them and they get way too close to each other. And so as they start coming up, you got, if you want some decent sized carrots, you got to thin them things out. Amen. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you have to ensure the ground is fertile. Sometimes there's too much acid, sometimes too much nitrogen. Mm -hmm. The plants can get too much water or they can get not enough water. Sometimes the temperature is too hot. Sometimes it's not hot enough. There's a lot of stuff to this farming thing, isn't there? Mm -hmm. There are so many things that can get in the way of somebody coming to Christ. The devil, actually, if you look at it through human eyes, he has the upper hand. He has three million ways. God gives one way. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. No man cometh to the Father but by me. And the devil gives you three million ways. In the world right now, everybody's jumping onto all those different ways. And let's just throw away doctrine. Amen? And we're never going to throw away doctrine. God will have to take us home. Too much acid, not enough nitrogen, too much nitrogen. Bad early frost, bad late frost, too much wind, too much water, not enough water, too much lime, not enough sunlight, too high temperatures, too cool at night, not enough potassium, uh, manure was too hot, not enough mulch, blossom rot, black rot, end rot, and on and on and on it goes. Amen? Amen. Amen. So what's the solution for us? Pay attention to the Holy Ghost. Pay attention to the Holy Ghost. Learn to listen to the Holy Ghost's voice. He talks to Christians. He leads us. The Bible says he'll lead us into all truth. If he's going to lead us into all truth, do you think he's working on the hearts of men, even lost men? And do you think he knows how to lead us to somebody that needs to hear the gospel message? But we listen to ourselves and we use our intellect. And so sometimes we come and we throw a bunch of water on something where there's already been enough water and now there's too much water. You see, there comes a point when you're no longer witnessing, you're nagging somebody. And what do they do when they sense that? They dig in their heels. They don't want to listen. You can't force somebody to get saved. <laughs> And when they sense that you're trying to force them, you know what the impression is? It's no longer that you care. Oh, you want a notch in your gun. You want to be able to say you led somebody to Christ. And Christians have earned that reputation. Whether we like it or whether we don't like it, we've kind of earned that reputation. So we come, some, a plant's got two inches of water standing around it, and we say, we're going to water, and we dump a bucket of water on it. And the plant says, I'm drowning here. I'm drowning. But the Holy Ghost will lead you into the right thing to do. If you need to pull some of that water out, the Holy Ghost will lead you into pulling some of the water out. You should ask the Holy Ghost to help you recognize it when he is speaking. Listen to him. Sometimes it's a good idea just to plant the seed and leave it be. Don't keep hassling the person. Don't keep harassing the person. Plant it and let it be until the Holy Ghost says, the ground's getting a little dry. You need to go put a little bit of water on it. Then listen to the Holy Ghost and go put a little water on it. Amen. 
While those who sow abundantly will reap abundantly, it's also true that you can heap too much on one person. And oftentimes that's somebody that's a loved one. We want that person to get saved so bad. We don't want to watch them get tossed into hell. And so we just want to strong arm them, force them into salvation. You know, this, this preacher has a burden for second generation Christians because if a child makes a decision for salvation based on pressure from parents, you know why you get saved? Because you're a sinner that's headed for hell. If a kid gets saved because that's what mom and dad wants them to do, they didn't get saved at all. Amen. If a kid gets saved at church camp because all of their buddies are saying, you need to go up there and do it. You need to go up there and do it. Okay, okay, I'm going. Or I'm not going to go. Chicken, you're such a chicken. Okay, okay, I'm going. I'm not afraid. That's perfect. And they didn't get saved at all because they did it because of peer pressure. And now you may have just forced that person into hell because they're going to always have that experience to go back to where they didn't really get saved because you can't get saved if you're not lost. Mm -hmm. Amen. You can only get saved when you recognize you're a sinner that's headed for hell and your only remedy is the Lord Jesus Christ. You don't get saved by doing what your parents want. You don't get saved by yielding to peer pressure of your friends. I think church camp is a wonderful thing, but I think a lot of kids, and you can tell a fruit by its, the, a tree by its fruit. There's kids who go to church camp and they get saved, saved, <laughs> and later on in their life, they're just a devil. They never got saved. They yielded to pressure of the counselor, pressure of the... See, you don't pressure somebody into getting saved. You tell them their condition. Mm -hmm. And then it's up to God. And you say, well, I can't do anything except tell them about their condition. Yes, you can go back and weep over their soul. <laughs> Amen? Amen? Is all this tying together? It's mm -hmm. a good message. Verse 37 says, One soweth and another reapen, reapeth. Those two statements, verses 37 and 38 in John chapter 4, are self explanatory. We don't really have to go into them. I think I might have bounced ahead a little bit on our study, but that's okay. Another. Um, cross-reference for that for verses 37 and 38 if you want to mark it down is Matthew 21 28 basically go work today in my vineyard <laughs> amen. amen so now let's look at uh, well why don't we save that for next week I think we're out of time we'll save that for next week Lord, we thank you for this evening. God, I pray that Christians would take this message to heart. I pray that you'd break our hearts for souls. Mm -hmm. I pray, Lord, that we'd weep over souls. I pray, Lord, that we would be have a desire for souls that you have for souls. You looked over the city of Jerusalem and you wept. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how oft would I have spread my wings and gathered you as a hen gathereth her chicks, but ye would not. I think of Alamosa, and I think of the poor spiritual condition this city's in, Lord. And I love them to come and get saved. I can't force them to, Lord. All we can do is pray that you'd help us make the ground right, that you'd help us clear the stumps and the rocks, get the right amount of nutrients into the ground. 
or maybe this preaching would start taking hold and people would start getting saved. But Lord, in truth, the whole world is in a mess with all this ecumenical garbage and people flocking back under the umbrella of the Roman Catholic Church. God, help us to be a bright light shining that people will see there's a difference. And God, we love you. We want to bring as many souls to you as we can. We pray for your blessing in that endeavor.